Okay, good afternoon. We are going to start. Um, before I say anything, I, I need to, um, <clears throat> to mention that um, this lecture is going, <clears throat> sorry, is going to be recorded and posted um, um, online and uh, uh, on the on the on the um, on the site of the Jean Monnet Center at the University of Trento under my name uh, and the name of the university and so on because uh, this is a, this is this is this lecture is part of a project uh, of a Jean Monnet chair I hold and um, and uh, and thanks to this chair, I have the opportunity to invite a few people to hold the lecture for uh, my our students. And so, um, um, for reasons of privacy, you should, uh, um, if you do not want to be taped, um, you should make it known now, please. Otherwise, uh, I will assume that you have no problem in being taped in case you ask a question at the end. I would advise everyone to switch off your, um, um, your uh, video and your audio. And uh, at the end, with the exception, of course, of our guest, <laughs> and uh, at the end of the lecture, um, there will be an opportunity, of course, to ask questions. If you do not want to be taped, you can uh, ask your questions in the chat. Uh, so it is a real pleasure to have uh, with us today Pietro De Perini, uh, who um, holds a PhD in international politics from the University of London, from the City University of London, I guess it's the full name, uh, and it's currently a research fellow at the University of Padova in the Department of Political Science, Law and International Studies, and where he teaches human rights in international politics uh, at the MA level in the uh, program in human rights and multi-level governance. He's also affiliated with the Human Rights Center at the University of Padova, where he directs uh, or, or is, uh, is co-editor-in-chief of the Italian yearbook on human rights. So if you are interested in human rights, uh, is your, um, um, how can I put, put it, point of reference, I guess. Um, and is also managing editor of the journal Peace, Human Rights, Governance. Um, so his lecture is going, of course, uh, to focus on uh, the European Union and human rights. And um, um, what else should I say? Well, I, not very much more, I guess. I, I just want to thank Pietro for um, accepting my invitation to be with us today. He will talk for about an hour, is that right? Pietro, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and um, you have read um, his article on human rights, which is on your um, mail, uh, sorry, not mail, uh, reading list. And so you have, you have, uh, I hope, some background to the lecture. And um, and uh, and uh, tomorrow we have the regular our regular class at four o'clock. So that's, I guess, this is all. So um, again, thank you, Pietro, and and I leave the the, the, the stage to you. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Actually, when you speak with human rights, you have, you have as well very good human rights expert in in Trent, including Professor Dona. Uh, but I'm I'm happy to to be uh, referred to as a uh, someone who can talk about uh, human rights in within this broader international politics debate. So uh, actually, when Professor Berloni told me you have a course on Europe and its neighbors, uh, I was somehow, uh, you know, envy about that because in Padova, yes, we have plenty of uh, courses on human rights, international politics and on the European Union, but we don't have specific courses on, on the external dimension of Europe and we tend to include issues related to the external dimension within other classes such as in mine on human rights and international politics. So if I can uh, share the screen, uh, yes I can, so um, I'm happy to share my uh, PowerPoint here, uh, you should be able to, to see it. Um, so 
here is the the title we agreed for for this class which is on you Euro, european union human rights foreign policy continue continuity and change in the mediterranean neighborhood and the plan which i thought for this uh, lecture as as professor belloni was was saying uh, uh, implies that i will be talking for about one hour and then hopefully i will leave some space for q a and the way in which i would like to structure this seminar or lecture is first of all uh, with some conceptual if you wish uh, discussion about the 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 role and and the place of human rights in foreign policies how these two concepts actually relate in the broader debate and what are the key issues and problems then i would like to apply this type of conceptual reflection to the european union so what is the the role and place of human rights in the context of eu foreign policy and then as implied uh, by the title of this lecture, I would like to focus on a case study also uh, with, a, with a view to uh, verify if some of the uh, conceptual reflection I will share with you during the first part of the lecture apply in the context of what does this say about European Union human rights policy when it comes uh, with the neighborhood and specifically in my case, the reference will be to what we can define the Southern EU neighborhood, that is the uh, Mediterranean. So uh, let's let's start. Um, I mean, uh, there are two key concepts in this lecture. One is human rights, and the other is uh, foreign policy. Of course, another one would be the European Union, but I assume I don't need to to go more in deep with that. And I, I pretty assume that these two concepts are somehow self-evident. But I would like to spend a couple of minutes to introduce them, at least to uh, be sure that we share the same. Uh, perspective on that. So uh, the first is human rights, and uh, we, I, I can draw this definition by Donnelly and Willian, which are two quite important international relations scholars dealing with human rights. And uh, they, they and right, the human rights are uh, very basically the rights that one has simply because he is or she is human, and that are held by all human beings, irrespective, regardless of any difference. Of course, since we are dealing with the international politics, international relations, we uh, intend human rights, especially as these have been gradually recognized by the international community in international human rights law and institutions, especially uh, from the adoption of the United Nations Charter in 1945. There has been this long uh, process, which can be referred as the process of internationalization of human rights, which has led to establish a very uh, heterogeneous corpus, uh, corpus of norms and international obligations related uh, to human rights and to establish uh, a series of mechanisms both within uh, the, the United Nations and within a number of regional organizations such as the Council of Europe or the Organization of American States, which provide uh, precise obligation for states to promote, fulfill, and uh, respect human rights in their uh, jurisdictions. And um, of course, the, the key uh, principle underlying human rights is that they are universal, interdependent, and indivisible. Uh, of course, indivisible means substantially that uh, uh, is the idea that no right is secure if all other rights are, are not secure and which means very basically that uh, if I can't enjoy civil rights, if I can't enjoy a political, economic, social and cultural rights, uh, and uh, the principle of interdependence, which is something that we are witnessing very directly also in the case of COVID, of course, is the idea that no person's rights are secure unless uh, all people's rights are secure. What is important overall when we deal with human rights uh, is that uh, substantially, um, although you, through this corpus of international uh, law and the creation of this mechanism, human rights have been globally recognized as a, a response to injustice, at the end of the day, asserting a human rights eventually is making a political claim. When we, when someone uh, uh, tried to advance human rights, uh, it, uh, uh, is, it, it is somehow challenging the conventional understanding of the social and political orders, which in many countries is 
particularly uh, contested and controversial. Therefore, of course, when we deal with human rights in international politics or in foreign policy specifically, we deal with quite a controversial and contested concept, which is part and parcel of the political uh, debates among states. Uh, the other key uh, definition is that of foreign policy. Of course, if we look at the literature on foreign policy and foreign policy analysis, we have plenty of very good definitions. Most are very long and descriptive. I tendentially uh, like very much this one, which is provided by Christopher Hill, who is uh, a British foreign policy analyst, uh, very important one, which was also brought a number of important contribution to understand the foreign policy of the European Union specifically. And according to Christopher Hill, uh, foreign policy is the sum of the official external relation conducted by an independent actor in international relations. And this definition, I think, is uh, particularly important, not just because it's very concise and give very to the point uh, idea what we mean with foreign policy, but also for what for, for what it doesn't say, what is within the lines. For instance, reference to uh, independent actors enable us to include other entities which are not the nation states, which according to the uh, no, history of international relation are the key actors in, in, international, uh, in, in foreign policy and, um, and still represent the most, probably the most important actors in the context of foreign policy. And it also allow us to uh, include other non-state entities such as uh, for which, which however has their own independent uh, agency in international relations such as a terrorist group like the ISIS or some political group which managed to have their uh, international independence. And the other uh, word uh, within the lines is that of official, uh, of this official external relation and uh, uh, this allow us to include the um, outputs from all parts of the of the um, governing mechanism of the of the entity of the state uh, uh, in reference not only the foreign minister it's quite shared as common wisdom that uh, foreign policy is at the uh, cusp between domestic and international uh, constraints and therefore uh, foreign policy making is increasingly affected not just for by those who have their foreign policy prerogatives, the foreign minister in Italy, the prime minister, but also by uh, a large number of other actors within the, 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 the broader uh, governing mechanism of, of a country in this case. And I think that a good example of this can be Italy. Uh, a few years ago, under the yellow-green government, there was a survey by um, an, a research institute uh, in Siena uh, who asked who, according to uh, interviewees was the key foreign policy makers in Italy and the majority of interviewees said it was the, the entire minister was Salvini and not for instance the, the foreign minister Moavero who had only seven percent of votes. So uh, official allow us to include all the parts of the of the of the governing mechanism but at the same time also to be parsimonious to some extent on the vast number of um, international transactions which are normally being uh, conducted. And the third uh, element of this definition, which I think is particularly interested, is that foreign policy is not a policy or a decision, but is the sum of a number of decisions. And this is uh, implies that actors usually um, seek some degree of coherence towards the outside world. Uh, they, they are, and they are also assumed by other actors to be um, following a reasonably coherent and credible uh, line in, in, in foreign policy, which also implies that it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to change the line of a foreign policy when new uh, parties or new groups uh, come uh, uh, into power in a, in a specific uh, uh, situation. Okay, so this is broadly speaking the, the reference to the, uh, the Chuki uh, aspect. Now we try to we try to combine the two uh, together. The first thing which I must uh, highlight is that uh, while uh, for uh, you know all countries there is an, an obligation to promote, fulfill, respect, and fulfill human rights within their jurisdiction, we don't have such obligation as far as foreign policy is concerned. Uh, no, there is no treaty, no convention which force 
countries to to include human rights in their in their foreign policy and this is especially tricky if we consider that uh, we can also intend foreign policy as a sort of synonym with uh, realizing national interest okay so uh, or protecting national interest from outside interferences so uh, if we go you know some some years uh, behind when the realist paradigm was the was the most uh, uh, widespread in international relations. Of course, um, uh, there was this distinction very clear between high politics and, and, and low politics and uh, uh, everything which was not, uh, uh, every type of interest that an actor could have beyond proper security was considered inconsequential. So we, we wouldn't be even you know, discussing human rights if we had to accept this approach to, to analyze the international relations. But now I think that virtually all states uh, uh, pursue, uh, uh, pursue a great number of other interests in their foreign policy, especially bilaterally. Uh, and therefore we may um, understand foreign po policy, the national interest in foreign policy as uh, represented by security, economic, and a wealth of other interests, which of course change from country to country. Uh, environment, for instance, and uh, environmental politics is increasingly uh, part of the national interest of some coastal countries, for instance, uh, such as the Maldives, uh, just to give an example. And, uh, and this is the other interest folder is precisely where uh, we can include the place of human rights in, in, in foreign policy as one of the many interests that actors can pursue in the, in the context of uh, foreign policy. And uh, they can pursue human rights either instrumentally, because for instance, they believe that dealing commercially, trading with another country which has a good human rights record can be more fruitful, and effective or can uh, cover uh, the country from outcry related to bad uh, human rights situation in, in the partner country or there can even be a more if you wish genuinely uh, interest of the country in uh, promoting human rights with a view to contribute shaping a more just uh, world. Uh, whatever uh, reason uh, human rights are promoted for uh, what I think must be taken into consideration when we specifically discuss the role and place of human rights in foreign policy is that uh, it, human rights being part of the construction of the national interest need to be in balance, uh, be considered in balance with the other interests which make up the national interest of the country, which of course include also security, economic and other interests. And there, is, there are also hierarchies among this type of interest, which does not motivate why uh, human rights are often uh, neglected or, or, or not uh, particularly consistently promoted by countries who say they are promoting human rights, but help us to some extent to better frame and, and understand why we often have trade-offs, uh, double standards, and other type of compromises when human rights are concerned. And uh, another way to look at this issue is uh, uh, considering foreign policy as uh, how an actor sees itself, the world around it, and its place uh, in the world. And uh, this uh, led to consideration of status, legitimation, international perception, and international credibility. So it's, there, there is a very uh, red thread, very thin red thread between those who are actually principal promoters, what uh, scholars like Alison Brisk call global good Samaritans, this country which substantially, in, in which substantially the national interest coincides with the global interest, which is uphold with, uh, apprented with, with the norms and principles which uh, make up the, the, the international human rights regime and those those countries which, yes, are very committed to human rights, but they are doing it because they don't have other uh, areas where they can acquire some international reputation and status. And once again, I think that Italy is, is a good example. And uh, of course, Italy, if you read the various speeches by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Prime Minister, whatever, is a champion 
of human rights, but as, at the same time, when when you really look and the way in which it, it practice what it, it, it preaches internationally, you can see a number of contradictions, which at least uh, can uh, let you doubt about uh, the, the, the genuine mm, commitment to human rights of the countries overall. But to conclude this very uh, broad uh, overview about these two concepts, I think that especially when we when we deal with the, with the liberal democracy and at the end of the day when we deal with the Euro, with the European Union we deal with with a group essentially also of of, of liberal democracy uh, we we don't even have to consider whether human rights are or not within the the, the, the broader um, frame of the foreign policy conducted by these actors what we need to stressed and to investigate is rather what 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 this foreign policy is made of where it is uh, pursued how aggressively and and consistently as for instance also david uh, foresight implies in his in his in his work on on foreign policy and human rights and with this in mind uh, we try to um, apply this uh, conceptual linkages to the specific domain of today's lecture, which is European Union and the foreign policy or external action as the European Union prefer to, to call it globally of the, uh, 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 of the European Union. Um, of course, uh, when, when, you apply, when we try to apply this consideration to the European Union, the situation is even more complex than what I was uh, mentioning, outlining just above, because when we spoke about you, the EU, we need to somehow put together uh, the national interest and the foreign policy priorities of 27 member states together with uh, the, the construction of a broader common uh, national interest of national interest of Europe or common European interest, which, although there have been quite a lot of progress and improvements over the last 20 years has proved very difficult to build and I would say is still under uh, constructions. Uh, another issue which may take into consideration is that it's not so straightforward to define who makes you foreign policy. And I, I don't know if you if you follow the news in these days, but I think that if you heard about the Sofa Gate in Turkey, uh, can show that it, <laughs> there are different ways of understanding, for instance, who represents the European Union abroad. In that case, uh, I'm referring to the, the meeting by the president of the Commission for the Leyen and the president of the European Council, Michel, with Turkey uh, president, and uh, the, 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 the issue that there was not a chair for the, for the, for the president of the Commission, besides the fact that it's a gender issue, also showed that there might be different ways of understanding who is actually representing the European Union, who is who representing the states in the context of the more uh, the, our, uh, common foreign uh, common foreign security policy, or is rather the, the Commission, which is the the head of the of the government of the EU to some extent, and represent the broader European interest on this matter when it comes to external representation. So we have a plenty of extra uh, problems when it comes to to Europe. What I will um, try to do. Uh, now is to try to uh, answer to some more broader questions, trying to uh, to, um, to, to to somehow to um, give this issue as for granted. So try to consider that there is a common European interest and in referring to it, and to see where do actually human rights stand within the context of formulation of EU foreign policy. How wide is the the gap between the rhetoric and performance when the European Union apply uh, its commitment on human rights and finally uh, using in particular the example from the Mediterranean how consistent are actually human rights in EU uh, foreign policy and uh, um, okay uh, yeah I, I think that a, a good way and a quick way to uh, I, I don't want to spend much time on this because I, I, I'm pretty sure that you already have an overview of your foreign policy broadly speaking so I'm just taking some excerpts from 
some legal and policy documents to, to give an overview of where human rights are uh, in foreign policy. So if we take the treaties, the fundamental, uh, the, the fundamental treaties, and in particular, the treaty on the European Union, and we look at Article 21, we are very lucky because it's very quick in, in, since we have two, in two commas, we have both the principle and the objectives which shape or are expected to shape you. Uh, action in, in international relations. And you can see, I mean, uh, all, all values which are listed here are somehow uh, easy to connect with the broader human rights discourse, but I have highlighted the, the most relevant uh, word and the universality and divisibility of human rights and fundamental freedoms is together with democracy, the rule of law, the respect of human dignity among the values which are expected to guide overall you action on the external uh, sphere. And also there is uh, an explicit and an implicit reference after all, because when, of course, uh, in, in the documents of the European Union, we see a reference to the principle of the United Nations Charter to international law as it is in this, in this slide, uh, of course, we know that uh, human uh, the United Nations uh, include human rights both among their fun funding principles and among their key purposes. So it's, it's another way to, to strengthen the, 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 the centrality of human rights within the broader framework. Uh, if we look at the objectives, and I apologize for the very thick uh, slide, of course, many, many scholars uh, consider that having a look of how and what objectives are stated, in, it, it's a good way to understand how the interest, the national interest, broadly speaking, is shaped. So if we look at this list of objectives, we can see that uh, indeed we have security, economic and other objectives and, uh, and other uh, and human rights are, are part of, of these other objectives and interest, uh, both explicitly again in the, in the, in the uh, line B where together with the rule of law and support of democracy uh, are included among the, the, the objectives that you action must help consolidating and support. And also, again, less implicitly, for instance, in, in, in line C, which refer to the, the goal of preserving peace and preventing conflicts, it's to be made in, con in, in accordance with the purpose and principle, again, of the UN Charter. But also as far as, for instance, goal D and F are, are included, the reference to development is again a, a, an indirect reference to human rights, especially if we consider what is currently the blueprint of action of the international community on development issues, which is the, the, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, we know that this, the text of the 2030 Agenda is strongly rooted in human rights law. Uh, some research institutes, such as, for instance, uh, the Danish Institute for Human Rights, which is a research institute in, in Denmark, of course, has made a study which substantially showed that 19.2% of the goals and targets of the 2030 Agenda are rooted and can, be, can find a uh, an equivalent in international uh, human rights law. Of course, besides promoting human rights, there are other, other more traditional interests, such as that of safeguarding its values, fundamental interests, security, independence, and integrity, and also economic uh, type of interest. So when we, when we look at how the European Union promote and implement human rights in the context of, of its foreign policy, we also need to take into consideration that human rights must be balanced and considered in the broader context of this list of uh, objectives. Uh, and somehow part of this, some of these uh, objectives uh, can you know, prevail other, uh, over others. And uh, the, I'm not saying that this list is hierarchical. So uh, objective A is the main and the others follows. But uh, we, we need to uh, frame the commitment to human rights within a broader, more, uh, more multifaceted uh, interest, which uh, includes several areas of action and commitment. And these are, of course, the treaties, which were also uh, the, 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 the Treaty of Lisbon was adopted, as you know, in 2007. So it was another word 
to some extent, the world and the, the framework of international relation have, has changed substantially over the last 20 years. So I've just taken um, a couple of, uh, uh, you know, excerpts from other more policy oriented document. For instance, these two excerpts come from the European Union Global Strategy, which was the uh, strategic document adopted in June 2016 on initiatives of the previous, the previous High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Federica Mogherini, uh, and which promised to, to frame all action and all tools of foreign policy within the same strategic view. And you can see from these very brief excerpts that, again, the European Union considers itself in foreign policy a champion of the indivisibility and universality of human rights. Strangely, the, it, not, it does not mention the interdependence, why interdependence is mentioned in, in, in the treaties. Uh, and, uh, and the other interesting uh, element which comes from this expert, excerpt is that, at least in this uh, strategic document, uh, uh, the, the security, the prosperity, uh, and the integrity of the European Union is understood in, uh, in compliance with the, the commitment to preserve security, uh, prosperity, and integrity of the European Union is understood in terms of commitment to uh, human rights and the rule of law. And since uh, not sure that talking about post-COVID is correct nowadays, but in, uh, of course, among the various uh, damages that uh, the COVID pandemic brought, uh, one is uh, a damage to the functioning uh, of multilateralism, or rather it has showed the weaknesses of the current uh, multilateral uh, system. So of course there is a new, uh, multi-actor effort which is trying to find uh, ways to strengthen, to reform to some extent the current uh, multilateralism. Uh, and uh, there is a joint communication which was adopted some one month ago, I think, by the High Representative and the Commission where uh, it is stated what the European Union can do to contribute to this effort of strengthening multilateralism and again you can see the commitment on human rights, fundamental freedoms, and the respect for human dignity, and the determination in defending those principles internationally and push back against attempts to undermine them. Also because compared to when the treaties were adopted, human rights are, uh, broadly speaking, globally speaking, facing uh, a particularly uh, problematic uh, period in every corner uh, of the world. Um, so, uh, this is of course very, uh, very broad and are just some excerpt, but I think gave us an idea that both in the found legal foundation and in the policy uh, strategy and, and, and consideration of the European Union, human rights are uh, definitely a core, a core item. Of course, we are in the realm of the political rhetoric to some extent. So. Uh, I thought it might have been interesting also to have a look of, 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 of the means of implementation, what we can, to, we can call uh, the foreign policy tools or instrument through which the EU can has the capability, in fact, to put in practice what she says and promises actually in the context of its documents uh, and, uh, and uh, declarations and strategies and so forth. So, um, the EU has a number of tools as any other state, I would say, from more quiet type of private diplomacy to uh, more uh, coercive and assertive political and economic uh, type of tools. But I think that for the sake of, of today's um, lecture or seminar, we may um, place our uh, attention on, on three of them, on three uh, rather than tools, toolboxes, which are uh, particularly relevant, recent, and updated. And uh, uh, one is certainly uh, the European Union uh, Human Rights Guidelines, as they are uh, called in jargon. And these are substantially uh, some documents which uh, define how the European Union 
uh, work to implement and protect a, num a specific number of uh, categories of rights or of vulnerable uh, people. You can see some of the uh, themes or topics of these guidelines in the slide, from death penalty to torture, to the promotion of freedom of religions, to the protection of LGBTI rights or of human rights defenders, as the acronym HRD uh, means, and so forth. And here is the link, which in a way tell us something about the, the relevance that actually this guideline has, uh, despite the commitment in, in the broader definition of EU policy strategy. It, it is a 404 error for the most nerds among you. This, this is a, a wrong link, but actually if you click it, you can find the guidelines, which are otherwise a bit difficult to be found, but they remain an important important uh, elements also because they are adopted by they have been adopted by the council and therefore they also represent an agreement among member states on how the european union must promote human rights and these guidelines are there uh, uh, circulated and uh, provided to all delegation of the eu across the world which means that the, the guidelines one of the reasons why the guidelines are important is that they try to make european action uh, on human rights teams consistent and uh, equal uh, and, and the same uh, in every corner where the European Union has its own presence. The other two uh, elements which I added in these uh, in these slides are more recent. Uh, one is the, the multi-annual action plans for human rights and democracy, uh, which uh, substantially is a plan which sets out the EU level of ambitions and the priorities towards all third countries in the context of, uh, of human rights and democracy promotion. And uh, uh, for each uh, priority, uh, there is a number of tools which can be employed to, to achieve the stated goals. And uh, the, the first of these plans were adopted, was adopted in uh, 2010. I guess, and then it was uh, updated uh, every four years. The last one was adopted in November 2020, a bit late, but of course the pandemic has altered the, the timing no, and of the political agenda of the EU, not necessarily for, for the bad, if I must be honest, but eventually uh, the guy, uh, the, this action plan was, was, was adopted in November 2020, and among the the news, besides the traditional commitment of this plan to give priority to empowering individuals, um, building resilient, inclusive societies, and contribute to shaping an, an international rule-based global order where human rights and democracy are at the core, uh, also uh, introduce, I think for the first time, an investment in new technologies, which of course the COVID pandemic uh, contributed to, to show the, 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 both the, the, the fragility of human rights everywhere, but also the importance that uh, new technologies can have in trying to stem the, the consequence uh, of this situation. And the second very significant, at least in principle, uh, contribution which is included in this action plan was a, a commitment of the European Union to develop uh, a new horizontal EU uh, global human rights sanctions regime, which uh, was then uh, adopted by the Council uh, one month later in September 2020. Uh, the European Union is no, is an actor in dialogue, they say, so it always prefers soft tools. We have, you know, a number of, probably you know it better than me, a number of definition or concept like soft power, normative power and so forth, which, or going back in the time, civilian power and so forth, which, uh, you know, uh, give this idea of the EU as a, an actor which prefer to dialogue and, uh, and uh, trying to reflect with other partners in the way in which some objectives can uh, achieve uh, through mutual support and contribution, and has normally been weak in the use of more coercive type of tools or even more reluctant also because to, for instance, decide sanctions against a country violating human rights, there is long bureaucratic procedures and to establish the framework to adopt these sanctions, you need to, you know, to find an agreement between the various institutions. So from this perspective, this sanction regime promised to be a quite significant step forward uh, because uh, it 
it, in principle, it will allow the European Union to proceed uh, quicker, to be more efficient without uh, you know, taking time to establish every time a legal framework for any case. There is, uh, I've not studied that in depth so, uh, so far, but there is a, a very uh, well detailed list of human rights violations that can uh, bring to, to adopt sanctions, which are not intended as broad sanctions which can affect a country but rather as what uh, normally are referred to as uh, smart sanctions which are uh, directly uh, addressed towards specific individuals or entities which are um, which are uh, um, reported or proven to violate human rights and there is a long list of human rights violations which can be taken into account including uh, uh, genocide, uh, crime against humanity, but also torture, extrajudicial killing, uh, slavery, disappear forced disappearance, arbitrary arrests, uh, and uh, also trafficking in human beings, and so forth. So it's, it's a wide range of human rights violations. There is this framework. Uh, sanction, of course, are to be applied by EU member states, and the uh, decision to uh, list some individuals or entities uh, on the annex uh, towards which uh, sanctions are directed can come both by the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs Security Policy and by a member state, but the decision to act eventually has to be decided by the Council with the unanimity vote, which of course presents some traps to the actual functioning of this new uh, regime. So, uh, this is, uh, broadly speaking, the type of overview which I wanted to share with you. Now, I would like to move to the case study to see, despite all these maybe impressive also uh, apparatus of norms, uh, uh, policy objectives and tools that the US put in place over the years, how are these uh, applied to the case study to, to, in a specific area of EU foreign policy? And the case study, as I mentioned, uh, from the outset uh, is the Mediterranean, and I think it's it's quite good uh, case study when it comes uh, to to study the European Union for a number of uh, reasons. Of course, because it's part of the neighborhood, and this course is about Europe and, and this neighborhood, but also because differently from other geographical geopolitical areas towards which the EU. Uh, uh, promote, exert its, its foreign policy. Uh, the, the Mediterranean uh, uh, area uh, group together a number of countries which are, uh, you know, um, ruled by authoritarian leaders, which despite their countries have ratified formally the various treaties on human rights tend to resist, be skeptical or oppose any type of human rights agenda some time, they say, because it is an issue of, of cultural particularism, so that, you know, it's, it's, an, old, uh, it's an old refrain that uh, human rights are not universal because they come out from Western tradition, so they are imposed to other cultures, but more uh, probably because, as I said at the beginning, human rights represent the promotion of human rights and the promotion of actors which advance human rights represent quite a a significant challenge uh, to their to their understanding of political order and more significantly to their power and uh, uh, it's it's interesting to look at the mediterranean also because we can have an assessment of um, of change and continuity over quite a long period because at least as you can see from uh, this slide uh, at least from the early, or even before the early 90s, I mean, already during the Cold War, the Mediterranean has been a priority area for, for, for European, uh, the European community before 1992 and the European Union then. Now we have substantially one real policy that deal with, 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 with the Mediterranean neighborhood, which is the European neighborhood policy, which you know very well, started in the uh, finance 2003, started in 2004. As you know, the neighborhood policy is based on substantially bilateral relation and the principle of differentiated bi bilateralism. But at the same time, since the countries which to towards which this policy is directed uh, have, I don't know, belong to two very different areas and they have their own priorities and needs, they are 
in, in, in the various uh, way in which the, the ENP is developed, they are also regrouped regionally. And therefore, uh, it, despite the, the neighborhood policy is mainly bilateral, we continue to have a southern regional uh, dimension and an eastern regional dimension. And this specific uh, Mediterranean or southern dimension has been revised uh, twice so far, uh, besides all the other updates of the of the policy overall. Once in 2011, uh, following the the Arab uprisings or Arab Spring, if you wish. Uh, I, for me, it's like yesterday, but I recognized which is ten already ten years ago. So not maybe. All of you are familiar with these events, but after the Arab uprising, the European Union decided to revise the overall priorities and, and programs uh, for, for the south of the neighborhood. And again, uh, some one month ago, I guess, there was a new uh, joint communication which promote a new agenda for the Mediterranean in light of the challenges brought in particular by the COVID crisis. crisis. The, the other uh, policy within the Mediterranean is the is the Union for the Mediterranean, which I, I don't know, I mean, we can discuss about that. I don't even see it like really a policy or a policy initiative, but it's rather an intergovernmental group in which uh, adopts and implements some programs uh, related to the broader uh, Euro-Mediterranean uh, neighborhood, the, which received very small funding, but they still consider it as an important part of the of the regional uh, um, environment where the European neighborhood policy um, acts. And uh, I, of course, uh, maybe I'm already late, but um, uh, it's it's uh, even if we go back in the time, we can see that already from from the renovated Mediterranean policy in the 90s, human rights have been at the core of your commitment toward this region. So in every document from the 90s to nowadays, we will see that promoting human rights, rule of law, democracy with this country is among the priorities of this, of this area. Which led me to the really final uh, part of this short um, lecture. Um, which substantially uh, starts from uh, quite evident uh, uh, observation we can, we can make <laughs> on the current situation in the Mediterranean, where the majority of countries ranging from Morocco to Lebanon and Syria, of course, uh, is experiencing quite uh, problematic human rights situation. And uh, if we look at it from the European Union perspective, of course, considering that for the last 30 years, the US said and committed to promote human rights therein, that implied that probably these efforts have been either limited, insufficient, or unwilling to favor any significant improvements. Of course, we might also take a more minimal approach in considering the European Union, and we can explain the failure of human rights and democracy in these countries from many other perspectives. But uh, of course, uh, at least uh, since uh, a lot of <laughs> resources and commitment has been uh, spent on, on human rights by the EU, at least uh, uh, some we are uh, legitimate to expect some sort of benefits from uh, or improvement in the situation of human rights in these countries since uh, the EU has invested so much. And okay, this is a, a general observation, but if we look in particular uh, at, the, at the Arab Spring or Arab Uprising in 2010, 2011, uh, we may uh, found quite an empirical evidence of the failure of the European Union as far as human rights is concerned. The fact that, you know, the strong cry for democracy, for justice, human rights, which emerged from the revolts, which, um, which characterized the majority of Arab uh, countries during the early years of the previous decade, show us that the EU uh, in the EU human rights policy has, has failed. And if this is not enough, if we look at the, at the speeches of the various leaders uh, of the EU at that time, we can see a number of mea culpas also and acknowledgement of the, of the wrong behavior and wrong strategy followed by the European Union. And uh, uh, I would like, uh, I have one here, which I would like to quote directly because it's not so frequent that uh, uh, policy makers within the US this very clear acknowledgement of their failure, failure and the reason uh, for so. For instance, the former 
European Commissioner for Enlargement and the Neighborhood, it was the, the Czech uh, Stefan Fuhr. He said, for instance, that too many of us fell prey to the assumption that authoritarian regimes were a guarantee of stability in the region. This was not even real politic, it was at best short termism and the, th and the kind of short termism that makes the long term even more difficult to build. Or again, uh, the EU has always been active in promoting human rights and democracy in the neighborhood, but it has often focused too much on stability at the expense of uh, other objectives and more problematic at the expense of our values. So there was uh, substantially, if you wish, a recognition of the so-called stability democracy dilemma, which is that the EU actually has, has, has uh, prioritized uh, its own security and stability at the expense of the actual promotion of democracy and human rights in the country. And there were a number of new uh, initiatives, promises of paradigm shift in the context of the EU Mediterranean policy, but eventually these promises were not, uh, were not matched, uh, at least so far, by an appropriate uh, action. I mean, we had more resources, new programs to support civil society, like the European Endowment for Democracy. But again, if we look at the situation now, we can see that the situation of human rights has even worsened. So it's not all because of the EU weaknesses, but it also somehow shows, and I think we can collect a lot of evidence about that, that overall European Union has not uh, created a paradigm shift in the context of its approach to the neighborhood, especially as far as human rights are concerned. So it's legitimate, I think, to, to wonder why, no, in spite of a stronger renovated commitment on human rights for the last 30 years, the EU outcome on human rights in this area, in, in this neighborhood has been so, so poor overall, which is, uh, for those of you who have uh, kindly <laughs> read my my article is that the starting point of, of, of that research I've been made. And of course, I'm not the first one uh, to ask this. And uh, we have many ways to explain it. One is, of course, the rhetoric performance gap, which does not affect only human rights policy, but more broadly uh, speaking, uh, the, all areas of EU foreign policy, where the EU, for its own approach, tend to uh, highlight no, all the, the, the commitment it is developing in the context of foreign policy, but eventually the capability uh, to advance these promises is much more limited than what uh, could be expected, which also create a number of frustrations and uh, among the, the recipient of this policy. So in, in fact, it's a very dangerous type of gap. The other one, which we already mentioned, referred to the prevalence of the stability consideration in, the, in this securitization, democratization uh, dilemma. And if we think back at the objectives that are listed in the, in the, in the Article 21 on the Treaty of the European Union, we can see actually that if we consider all those objectives, our interests, which make up the common European interest, it's again a, a, an exchange of priorities among different interests. And uh, letter A, the one related to the stability and integrity of the EU, uh, has been prioritized in terms of other type of objectives, uh, which is, uh, I think, very normal, not only for the EU, but for a number of other states, unfortunately. And uh, my take, as you may have read, is that another reason is not about, you know, the only about these well-known gaps, but also there is a problem in the way in which EU policy is formulated. The, because eventually EU uh, foreign policy on human rights is formulated in a pretty vague and inconsistent manner, which of course contribute explaining why the output of this policy are eventually very weak and do not produce a significant change on, on the ground. And uh, uh, the, the reason uh, for me, uh, looking empirically, uh, the way in which the various human rights uh, initiative have been uh, launched by the EU over from the, 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 the policy of the 90s up to a few years ago, because the study is not <laughs> updated to to nowadays is that this vagueness and inconsistency eventually is not about, of course, uh, a difficulty in, in defining what are human rights, which are very well defined in international law and in the work of uh, human rights mechanisms, but is rather caused by the protect 
protracted incapability of the European Union to conciliate the different and competitive views that the key actors who affect the direction of the Mediterranean policy in this case uh, share about human rights. So the point is, without going too much in detail, since you actually have the, 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 the article, if you want to uh, deepen this, uh, or if you have a question about that, is that if you look at the various institutions and actors which shape EU Mediterranean policy, we have a number of gaps in terms of preferences or interest, if you prefer. We have a gap in the way in which different European institutions believe that human rights must be promoted. So for instance, uh, we have uh, like the, the parliament is uh, particularly vocal in, in, in uh, promoting uh, human rights and in trying to prioritize human rights related initiatives over other uh, type of objectives of the European Union it is particularly keener on denouncing violation by member by, by partner countries as well as by weakness by the various institutions. Then we have the commission that has a more uh, um, an approach which is more about uh, you know supporting efforts from the bottom up uh, by the civil society. So a way to uh, advance uh, uh, human rights by giving support to those actors in the field which can bring from the bottom up a change of this kind. And then again, the council, which of course represent the, the preference of all the member states, which is more uh, pragmatic, uh, if you wish, and uh, led by political consideration. And from this perspective, uh, cooperation, having a, a framework of cooperation and agreement, which cover security, uh, economic, environmental, and technological cooperation can uh, somehow be uh, prioritized over being too strict on, on human rights standards. And of course, this creates a sort of institutional schizophrenia in the EU when it presents its foreign policy uh, towards other countries, which we can see. But besides that, for instance, another divide or gaps which can be identified, especially when human rights are concerned in the Mediterranean, is a north-south divide, which is between uh, member states. Of course, member states in the north are in general uh, more uh, key, keener and more vigorous on, on, uh, on um, promoting human rights, also including the threat of sanction towards human rights abusers in, in these countries. And also they need to, to make uh, the, the, the cost of, of, of uh, external assistance accountable to their tax player because they don't have a direct interest in the Mediterranean. They are far from it. They are, they have, are more interested, for instance, in the development in Eastern Europe than in the Southern neighbors. And on the other end, we have Southern states like Italy, France, uh, Spain, etc., which are again more interested in, in, uh, in being engaged and cooperating with these countries rather than to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, and, and acknowledging the limits that this country may have in terms of promoting this type of values. And this, of course, is are again two very differ different uh, ways in which the issue of human rights is dealt with. And the third gap actually is between the fact that despite this difference, the European Union promotes human rights, is committed to promote human rights in its foreign policy and the type of resistance that the partner countries or the skepticism that partner countries is, uh, show towards this agenda. And the, the point is that these tensions between these different preferences eventually have produced over the years two diverse and unconnected efforts to advance human rights in the Mediterranean. One, which may term political dialogue is a top-down approach which uh, works among you know is political representative of institution and member states uh, and of course this is uh, more attentive to the needs of southern member states within the council and eventually sacrifice human rights to other interests of the EU in the Mediterranean so it's a very weak and inconsequential approach where human rights are rather uh, part of a uh, political discourse rather than being <laughs> an objective of EU international action. So they have this meeting where they discuss human rights achievement, what we could done, but eventually, as many have highlighted, these are ways to actually avoid discussing about serious human rights issues. And this is one thread. The other thread, which mostly uh, derived from the approaches of the Commission and the Parliament, is a way that try to support change from the, the bottom up. 
and and is mostly is more concrete, of course, because it's based on providing economic resources to these actors uh, of uh, civil society actors. But uh, uh, eventually, it is quite a fuzzy, contradictory, and contentious approach to promote human rights because, in, first of all, the European Union has its own understanding of what is civil society, which does not necessarily. Uh, um, is the same that Mediterranean or Arab countries in particular have, where, for instance, Muslim religious groups are part and parcel of society and form the biggest part of, of social capital. Uh, then, uh, of course, there, there is a difference in the, in the, in the, in the feature and capability of uh, civil society organization in the north of the Mediterranean in the south. And finally, it's problematic also because many countries in the South, besides being uh, worried about the human rights agenda of the EU, are also worried of the possible challenge brought by these actors, especially funders. So they, they tend to oppose the independence and the ability of these actors to attract uh, international, international funding. So it, 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 it's more concrete, but it has its own uh, problems. And in particular, is particularly revealing of the tensions which underline what I called before the boundary gaps. So that the different view vis-a-vis -vis human rights between this, the Northern and the Southern shore. So uh, I will conclude, of course, maybe I've already taken more than the hour I had agreed with Professor Belloni, but however, what emerged is that uh, looking at these 30 years and uh, honestly despite there have been a wealth of new human rights related policy documents over the last five six months i don't see much change in that uh, the european union has rarely found a balance among these two approaches so we have a, a country the, the the promotion of the engagement of society and the political dialogue do not really contribute to uh, to uh, mutually to enforce uh, the other, and this produced a number of contradiction, vaguenesses, and inconsistencies over time. So the EU has not been able so far to establish a comprehensive human rights approach towards the Mediterranean, which explain, uh, from my perspective, the, the overall uh, ineffectiveness of its policies. And of course, if we look at the three uh, gaps that I mentioned, the, the, the boundary gap that is the one between the European Union and the member states is the one that played the lion's share in affecting the role of, and the scope of human rights initiative in Mediterranean policy. And uh, of course, it, it, this is a bit uh, problematic because the policy is defined at the EU level, so uh, the Mediterranean countries are the recipient. But of course, this is very much linked to the fact that the EU institution and member states view on human rights remain distinct and distant so without having a common comprehensive and coherent voice on human rights of course the the recipient in negotiating the content of the policies can contribute to shaping them according to their need and necessity and honestly i've been working on the the current rule of law crisis in the European Union the problem you know with Hungary Poland and other countries the challenges that this bring to the European Union values overall. And you can see the same trend. Each institution has produced a number of tools, put resources on them, but eventually, uh, especially the Parliament, the Commission and the Council are not able to find a sort of inter-institutional agreement that can really allow these very good sometimes ideas and initiatives to brought uh, a change on the ground, especially as far, at least as far as EU values, not just human rights, but the whole set of EU values, which are uh, listed in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union and on Article 21 as the principal guiding EU external action are concerned. So, of course, conciliating this view would be crucial for have a more consistent and effective foreign policy as far as human rights is concerned in the Mediterranean, but I think elsewhere as well. And yes, this is more or less what I wanted to share with you. I hope I haven't still stolen all, all the time we have at our disposal and I remain available, of course, for any comments or, uh, or um, question you have on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you very much. I would um, suggest um, to ask uh, questions or make comments also comments are fine as well of course uh, um, in the in the chat I guess that's uh, that will be the, the easiest way 
also from a legal point of view, because uh, <laughs> because we have also this concern at the University of Trento, I guess in Padova is the same. I'm not sure. So I would open up the 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 opportunity for students to to interact uh, uh, in the chat, I guess. Or maybe I start, so I can um, I, I start by asking one question, so we can we can give uh, students um, a few minutes to 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 absorb the information from today. I guess <clears throat> I I um I like to ask you um well you well first of all thank you for the really comprehensive and and very informative lecture, which was very interesting and. Um, and useful uh, also in the context of the class, but also, of course, in its own terms. And um, um, you, you, you touched upon, but you really didn't say very much, I think, uh, um, about uh, the the issue of how human rights promotion is actually seen um, and received in the uh, in the Mediterranean by by the the, the target states. Uh, so those states where the European Union actually, with all the inconsistencies that you mentioned, actually tries to promote human rights. So I like to ask you whether there is a little bit to say about uh, uh, this type of situation. And uh, and of course I understand it's a, it's a, it's a broad region and. Uh, and of course, there are different actors. Uh, some, you know, there are the, the, the political actors and the civil society actors, and so on and so forth. So it's hard to 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 to, to generalize. But that said, uh, I wonder whether you can say a little bit about uh, how human rights promotion efforts uh, um, by the EU are received in the region. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Roberto. Yes, yeah, I, I just mentioned it. Uh, of course, my, my focus has uh, always been on the, the, the side of the European Union, but of course, understanding uh, the position of other countries vis a vis other actors vis a vis this policy is crucial as well. Well, uh, as I said, uh, well, if, if we look at the various negotiation processes, also in going back to the, for instance, the Barcelona Declaration, which I didn't really mention, but it was the, it's the, 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 the precursor of the type of policy we are, we are looking today. Uh, that there was an effort by the European Union to include human rights, but there was quite a resistance and there were frictions by the majority of of member uh, of partner countries uh, at the time to include human rights in the agenda because uh, well, it's quite evident i would say that if these countries would really <laughs> promote human rights in the which in the way in which they are uh, you know developed the uh, international human rights law there would be little space to continue their type of authoritarian grab on, on power so uh, of course uh, the the international community is quite committed at least rhetorically on on advancing the human rights agenda so in order to have cooperation uh, this country has to turn a blind eye to 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 human rights so they have to accept that human rights are part and parcel of cooperation but uh, they they come uh, into cooperation with the European Union because it, it, they are interested in all the rest that the European Union can offer to them, of course, especially in terms of economic gain and participation in the European common market. So I believe that over time uh, they, they have accepted the idea that they need to show some formal uh, type of human rights, but eventually all the, they, they refuse, oppose, and uh, uh, every type of uh, action which could really uh, brought about uh, change in the situation of human rights, and we so we are seeing very well uh, uh, with all the the cases of uh, human rights violation that are reported. We can also think about Egypt, for instance, the the case of Patrick. There is no action that the European Union can do, although I don't think it has made much, but that can make uh, change uh, the idea of the Egyptian government on the country. But but in the other side, of course, as far as I know, and I have studied it, uh, in, especially in some countries, I'm most interested in Egypt and, and Palestine, Israel, as, as a sub area of, of, of interest, uh, of research. Of course, uh, the, the, the 
the actors which belong to the civil society, but not only, also actors which uh, uh, relate to local authorities, local governments are increasingly uh, active in advancing human rights agenda and, and in trying to find ways to liaise with, uh, with the, the, the possibility which are offered by by the international community, broadly speaking, also beyond the European Union and its programs. But uh, very often, uh, the, the EU has problem in, in, in meeting, in, 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 achieve, in reaching them, actually. Uh, and therefore, eventually, despite the promises, again, that international community is making con concerning the, the promotion of human rights in this area, this risks to create more, you know, um, promises and expectation which are regularly met with uh, oppression and opposition by states. So, uh, I mean, it's, for, uh, of course, there is a, a cultural relativist opposition uh, motivation for some of these countries which say that, for instance, uh, the, the, the Human rights discourse is not uh, uh, is not consistent with the Islamic teaching or with the cultural and religious practice of this country. I mean, uh, as as a reason to reject uh, this type of commitment. But above all, I think that there is, for different reasons, but all countries in the area, from from Tunisia to Turkey, even if Turkey is not. Uh, under the European neighborhood policy, uh, they, they, they have an interest in refusing human rights in order to, to, to continue their, their grab of power eventually. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, thank you. It was a broad answer, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a broad question. Um, so there is a, actually, uh, maybe, maybe I made a mistake. I apologize with everyone. If you have no problem in being taped, you can actually turn on your video and uh, audio and you can ask your question directly so i see there is a question from virginia otherwise we'll read the question and uh, and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll actually you will i can make the question um uh, i was wondering what was uh, or is italy's position on the enp in the mediterranean mediterranean region uh, um, as a clear mediterranean interested uh, state because i read in the article uh, prodi's position and the position of southern uh, states the southern member states but i was wondering if italy had a clear position on the matter yeah, thank you. Thank you, Virginia, for, for your question. Yes, actually, also, I mean, yeah, Proudy, as president of the commission, uh, made a lot of efforts to, 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 to bring the Mediterranean in, in, in among the priority of the, of the European Union, not only as far as human rights are concerned. Another area in which I have worked concerned the, the exploitation of intercultural dialogue, again, as a, as a tool to bridge the two shores of the Mediterranean. And of course, it, it continued. Uh, okay, well, Italy is and has always been, I think, from the end of the Cold War, a country uh, concerned and interested in promoting Mediterranean cooperation. I mean, we are used to deal with the European Union initiatives, but also before the EU started to, to, to focus on, on the, 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 the Barcelona process and the European neighborhood policy, for instance, the foreign minister of Italy uh, proposed, I think, together with the foreign minister of France, the, the establishment of, of a conference for security and cooperation in the Mediterranean back in the 90s. So Italy has always pursed Mediterranean cooperation because uh, both for security and for economic reason, and also, if you wish, for adding some cultural uh, motivation for it. So, if your question if, is 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 if Italy had a role in in pushing European policy on the Mediterranean, of course it has. Actually, uh, when when uh, uh, Professor Bologna can of course correct me because he's much more expert than me. But as far as I know, the the, the European neighborhood policy was initially proposed by uh, central northern countries, maybe for, from the UK, as a, as an eastern policy as a policy uh, directed towards the east, the new border on the east. And it was because of the pressure by member states, in particular France and Italy, which eventually led the European uh, Commission to uh, widen the scope of the policy, including also the Mediterranean neighbor. So of course, France 
and Italy in different ways uh, have been the end and Spain as well, of course, have been the engine behind the Mediterranean policy of the EU. And this is, I believe, very clear in if you look at the, the, all the, the, the priorities of all uh, government that Italy had uh, since 1990, uh, even beyond uh, the color of the government, I mean, that was under Berlusconi, under Prodi, or under uh, Renzi, <laughs> to, to, to say uh, the Mediterranean has always been the core uh, geographic area where Italy has, has, has spent its energy in a European Union. I would say uh, I don't know if it's outside of the scope of this class, but uh, a very good example which shows Italy's commitment to work on the Mediterranean as Europe for the stability and security of the region was the, the, the war between uh, Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon in 2006, where actually Italy managed to, 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 const to build up from scratch substantially a European response to the crisis which eventually led to the uh, deployment of the United Nations peacekeeping mission UNIFIL which eventually solved the crisis. So I don't know if I really answer to your again to your question but yes. Yes, yes completely thank you. Okay I am um... there's another question by my Yes. By Pietro. Maybe I'll read it for, for the purpose of, you know, taping the intellectual. Yeah. Um, do you think an influ influential European country which promotes agendas and policies for Mediterranean partners could be a solution for this stalemate? Um, no. <laughs> well, uh, but, I mean, uh, we have influential. Uh, European countries which are interested in Mediterranean besides Italy, which we can assess as influential or not. I leave it to you. France, of course, has been quite influential. And uh, in back, back in uh, 2007, it was President Sarkozy who started uh, to who, 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 who pushed for for having a Mediterranean uni Union to to be in parallel with the, with the with the with the European Union, and that was mostly a way to avoid that Turkey entered the European Union. But however, France, of course, made a lot of efforts in order to uh, try to break the stalemate. But uh, of of Euro Mediterranean cooperation, broadly speaking, and uh, not, not specifically on human rights, I would say, uh, even if human rights are of course in the rhetoric of France politics as well as it is in Italy, in Italy's and in European Union policy. So. I'm not sure. I mean, well, I actually I interviewed uh, Prodi uh, for a, a research I made uh, on Mediterranean issues. And when I asked something about that, he told me that, uh, of course, the key problem is that increasingly, especially in the last 10 years, the European policy, uh, foreign policy and neighborhood policy is, is, is made by a country which is not interested in the Mediterranean, which is Berlin. So rather than an influential uh, country which resolved the stalemate, the problem would be to, to, to find a, a balance among member states and either to convince this, this non-Mediterranean state, which of course is Germany, to have the Mediterranean among its real priorities or either finding a, quali a very solid uh, coalition among the Mediterranean countries within the council in order to uh, change to some extent the policy. But eventually, I think that uh, as we are dealing with the human rights and Mediterranean policy, uh, rather than uh, looking at uh, specific countries or coalition of countries, the, the real goal should be to really work to find ways to have a consistent uh, and uh, homogeneous voice when it comes to spread uh, across the world and promote uh, EU values and EU priorities. This would help really the EU to have a voice in every area where it stays to be committed, uh, depend, regardless of the various orientation that the country has. Very good. Thank you very much. We have time. I, I guess we have a few more minutes for uh, an additional, additional question, if anyone wants to intervene.
no. Okay, interaction through via Zoom or internet is not always the, <laughs> the most, um, the easiest thing to do, I guess. Um, well, I, I, well, so I'm, because we have a, we have a couple of more, couple of final minutes, I'm, I'm actually curious to ask you a, a broad question, which I, and, and ask you whether what I'm going to say, um, is consistent with uh, with uh, the the reading you give of human rights promotion by the EU. Uh, that is to say, you touched upon very briefly and quickly on uh, these ideas of civilian power, soft power, and another version is a transformative power, etc., etc., etc. Is it correct? I mean, am I understanding correctly your perspective and your analysis if I say that um, this? Uh, uh, this, uh, this transformative uh, power, soft power, however we want to call it, uh, is actually um, overstated. I mean, is that coherent with what you, you said today, or, or you want to explain perhaps a little more uh, your view on uh, soft power, the European Union soft power, and particularly, of course, with regard to human rights? It's a good question, and I hope I'll be able to answer it in, in little time, honestly. Uh, well, I, I okay, something which I've always uh, uh, perceived while studying the European Union is that scholars uh, um, made a lot of efforts to, to define you know, somehow the European Union, which is a specific type of international actors, and they are, uh, they, they struggle with the way to define it. So they, they try different way try to grasp the peculiarity of, of the European Union and I don't think that either of these uh, power type of definition really matches the complexity and the heterogeneity of the European Union especially of course when it comes to to foreign policy so I'm not saying that it is over maybe it is I mean uh, uh, together with all this definition there was another one by Christopher Hill again which were uh, talking about the capability expectations gap which is another way that was tried to define the european union and although of course the the gap between capabilities and expectation has been narrowed with all the the progress that has been made i think that is not a matter of overstatement again but that the fact that probably we we cannot uh, uh, yet intend the eu as a, as a homogeneous unique power to some extent i am primarily uh, a foreign policy uh, analyst and foreign, uh, using foreign policy analysis and foreign policy analysis try to look at the various elements within that, try to open the black box of policy making. So considering the various contribution of different actors. So my, if you like, disciplinary bias is that of uh, doubting or questioning the, the unity uh, when when a uh, decision, when a foreign policy decision is made. So I don't, I, I, I of course, the, the, the European Parliament uh, can be seen as a, as a transformative, a soft power, also the Commission to some extent, but if we look at the intergovernmental dimension and the distance between the intergovernmental and the supranational dimension, we can see that parts of Europe do not row in that direction. So yes, I'm not saying it's overstated, but it's more a, a, a complex towards which the EU aims to go rather than a description of what is going on. Of course, if we compare the European Union to other big power on the international scene, such as the, the United States under Trump, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, it's of course uh, the uh, soft power is not overstated and it's, it's definitely compar comparatively it is more soft power than others. But uh, if we want really to capture the diversity and the heterogeneity of the European Union, I don't think I will ever recur to this concept if not to mention that there is a debate about that. I don't know if I really. Yeah, no, very good. It's it's, it's a very contested. At the end, every two years there is a new <laughs> effort to 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 use the, some some objective power, dialogic power to the EU, but eventually it's too complex and broad and heterogeneous to to find a, a definition which encapsulate its role in in global affairs. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, is there any any 
final comment someone has anything to add or wants to add something um okay i uh saw the well i well i well let me let me conclude simply by by <laughs> Thanking Pietro De Perini for uh, being with us today. It was very interesting. I, I also, um, I did not mention at the beginning, I, in my introduction, I apologize that um, Pietro published a very interesting book on this topic, which is called Intercultural Dialogue in EU Foreign Policy. And I'm actually not promoting the book out of the blue. I, I, I am, you know, it, it is typically uh the person who introduces someone else says he published this and that book i'm actually read the book and i appreciate it very much so i i i'm talking you know having read the book and uh, and um, so i i strongly recommend um, whoever is interested in learning more on this topic on the relationship between the european union and the mediterranean from a human rights perspective and um intercultural perspective um to to take a look at this uh, work published uh, about one year ago i guess if i remember uh, two may two by yeah yeah two two, two years ago yeah. but uh, there is also an article which is much shorter which takes the key argument in mediterranean politics so if they're interested okay. they can so write they... to me and i'm happy to provide uh, it in in pdf it's a shorter yeah. reading <laughs> And very good so there is a the, 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 let's call it the lazy version <laughs> okay jokes aside thank you very much and um and i'm going to stop the registration